Uh, good morning. We are at the point in the preaching schedule when uh, we give ourselves some opportunity to explore the Psalms. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them and you can turn with me to Psalm 11. This is where we are going to be today. And this, this Psalm, Psalm 11, is a Psalm of David. And it's a Psalm that could reflect the time in his life when he's fleeing from King Saul, who wanted to kill him because of how jealous he was of him. Or, and we're not quite sure that that's what's reflecting, it doesn't say anywhere, or it could also just be really any time in life when the world around us, around David, is shaken. Again, we're not exactly sure what the events in the background are, but we do know something is Bad hap something bad is happening, and his friends are telling him to get out, flee, go away. This was their counsel to him when the going gets tough. When times are hard and, and suffering is the norm, run, is what they're saying. And we've heard of, of fight or flight being a natural response to us whenever something uh, comes across us, maybe in conflict. But here it seems we're talking about flight or faith, so to speak. Now let me show you what I mean. Look at verse 1 here. David writes, In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? So, uh, it appears that some of David's allies, his friends, again, are telling him to flee. Fight or flight, flight or faith. Flee, they're saying. To go, to run, to run away from the, this problem and hide in the mountain, whatever your mountain is. And what's interesting about their counsel here is this verb to plead, to flee, is plural. As well as you can see your mountain. This is a plural your. Seeming also to suggest that this is kind of a popular slogan of the day. Kind of a a banner that people wave, you know, flee to your mountain. This is normal advice. If things get hard, run to your place of refuge, wherever, whatever that place of refuge might be. Flee to your mountain. Pick up the bottle. Drown your sorrows away. Turn up the TV to, to quiet the conflict in your life. Open the phone. Find intimacy there. Buy this product. Feel good about yourself. Flee to whatever your mountain is. But David is butting up against this and asking, how can you say these things, so-called friends? How can you offer this counsel? No mountain can rescue me. What does he say? God is the refuge for his people. In the Lord I take refuge is how David begins. His presence then is, is better than any cheap escape that can be offered on this side of heaven. Better than any mountain hideout you might find. Greater than these cheap alternatives. In Him I take refuge, David says. Uh, sometimes our family, we, we go on walks occasionally. Maybe through the neighborhood. Uh, at a park, along a river, when we visit new places, when we're in Indiana with Kate's family. And so we walk together. Or sometimes when we, are, uh, we carry our kids through, through busy crowds and random events. Some of you went to the farm show this past week. Maybe you carried your kids through these places. And we also probably hold their hands in parking lots. Maybe we even carry them to the car. And they could be terrified in any one of these places. But they're not. Eliza especially so. Why are they not terrified? Well, because they are with us. Mom and Dad. We are right there with them. We are their refuge in a strange and, and dangerous world. Paw Patrol isn't going to, to help them navigate these things. 
It might distract them for a short time. It might distract Ethan now. But the things the world offers is no lasting refuge. At the end of the day, where do they find comfort and refuge if they're scared of some non-existent thing in their closet? Mom and dad. Place of refuge. David chooses to take refuge in God. He chooses faith, not flight. By faith, he knows that God is near. A refuge to protect him and to care for him in the most difficult of circumstances and times. And now, we shouldn't think that this is an easy decision for him either. This is, this is a hard decision to, to stay and remain and choose faith over flight. He is in the face of, of real hardship. He feels temptation deeply in his soul. And the people counseling him to flee could, again, could very well be his friends, so he has to live with that reality of, of peer pressure, telling him to flee to your mountain, whatever that is. And so that on a human level, their counsel is appealing. We like our mountains, whatever they are. On that surface, this seems fine. This seems fine to delight in. Melody, if you need, if that does it again, you feel free to switch to the pulpit. I don't know what that was about. Now look at verse 2. For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. So they, they warn of the clear and present dangers facing David. His antagonizers legitimately are threatening to him. They are skilled archers with, with bows ready, knowing how to strike and how to, to kill. And they have such a lack of care, even so much so, that they're, they're willing to shoot in the dark in order to strike. They don't care what they're hitting, they're just shooting blind. Again, not caring what the collateral is. They are ravenous wolves. And their treachery is destroying the very fabric of society. The structural systems in place that allow society to function, they are tearing down and crushing. And David's friends, because of this, are telling him to go. You're defeated, man. Get out. Run. Again, you see that at the end of, of verse, verse 2. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? You're helpless. Faith or flight, what, what can you do? Run, is their advice. The righteous are helpless. There is nothing left to be done. What once was is now gone. Why waste your time, your resources, your life oh, is, is helpless? Why endeavor on this hopeless crusade of, of righteousness here? Go somewhere else. It's better to give up and, and flee the problems of this world, his friends are saying to him. Isolate yourself. Again, drown yourselves in, in whatever it is because the cares of the world are too great and they're never going to be achieved. They're never going to get better. Become apathetic because of the same realities. We get this. This really is a, a, a timeless temptation. Jesus was ultimately tempted with the very same type of things. He, he was told to run away from the danger that his God-appointed life got him into. Uh, some Pharisees came up to him and told him in Luke 13 to, to get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. But Jesus' faith was not shaken. He stayed. And later, Jesus' disciples in John 11 advised him not to go back to Jerusalem in order to raise Lazarus, to not go back there because the, the scribes and the Pharisees, what do they want to do? They, they're seeking to stone him. Don't go. Run away from that place. But Jesus had, had faith that God was working according to plan. That things would work out 
for the good of the people and the glory of God. We saw that as we read Genesis 50 during our, our, our worship time together. The, the foundation may have looked shaken and broken, but Jesus' faith remained unmoved as he trusted the Lord as his refuge. And this is what David does in the second half of this psalm here. And what we see here in this second half is where this type of unshakable faith, where it comes from. It comes from a steadfast confidence in knowing exactly who the Lord is and where He is residing. Even as the world around us seems to be crumbling, we know that God is, is ruling. He sees all that is happening. He is judging justly and that He will reward the faithful. And David takes confidence in this. So look at verse 4, the first two lines of verse 4. David writes, Why do I have refuge in the Lord? Here it is. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. Now in these days, surely when the temple was talked about, you would have been thinking of Solomon's great temple. Or even in the time of Jesus, you would be thinking of Herod's magnificent temple that was in Jerusalem at the time. But David, obviously, for one, he's, he's referring to need, neither of these things. He's not even referring to, to Solomon's temple. He's showing us that there is an even greater temple in heaven where the Lord resides. So it's one thing for these earthly rulers to have authority, but it's a whole other realm of authority by which God rules. The temples and the throne was the very seat of an empire. The, the authority ruled from that throne in the midst of the entire empire. But God's is greater, David's saying. It's not an earthly one constricted to a certain geography. No, it's, it's above all that. And Isaiah 66, what does Isaiah call the earth? It's, it's the Lord's footstool as he sits on his throne. It's his footstool. You can just imagine then how big God's kingdom is as it goes out from there. And he's ruling faithfully. He sees us. He sees you. No matter what is happening on earth, God is still the ultimate ruler, ruling carefully and faithfully for the good of his people. And that can be a refreshing idea. That the king is for you. So there's so many kingdoms now and in the past that don't seem to be for the people. But God is truly for you. And ultimately we'll see that in the sending of his son. And so when the foundations seem to be shaking, God is not scared or intimidated. Nothing happens in heaven, of heaven above or on earth around or even in, in hell below that he does not have grand authority over. And from his throne, he looks carefully and watches what takes place in the world that he made. It's the end of verse 4. It says, his eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. And the word see here comes with this, this connotation of seeing with intelligence, seeing with knowledge and understanding. In other words, God sees, he's paying attention, and he understands us at a different level than just if somebody was observing. And it says his eyelids test us. An interesting expression. Uh, it could be that this suggests his attention never wavers. Even if his eyes are closed, he is so perceptive that his eyelids still search out our hearts and minds. Or, potentially, David could be picturing sort of a, a furrow brow with eyes narrowed as a judge who is considering a ruling. Or an antique dealer who is, is exploring the intricacies of whatever antique has just been handed to them. Judging it appropriately, accurately. Testing it by his own knowledge and understanding of what it is. What happens? Well, from his throne, he, he judges the evil and the good. 
even the morally upright, are not exempt from his rulings. Look at the beginning of verse 5. The Lord tests the righteous. But this is not a bad thing. This is actually a good thing. His examination is for our good. For it refers to this process of, of proving. Or if you're in the metal world, assaying certain metals, certain precious metals. God tests the righteous to present them to the world as genuine and pure. This is what you do with those things. He removes the impurity from our lives and refines us. He makes us better and stronger and more, more pure as He holds, molds and shapes us by our hearts and minds through the heat of His fire into the image He desires for us and more. But the testing fires of, of God's judgments, though they look like that for the righteous, the other side of the coin is they're entirely devastating to the wicked. And we can see that here in the rest of verse 5 and 6. What does it say? Well, it says, But his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur, and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. So often, people who are curious about our faith are curious about things such as these. And they'll ask, well, well, why does God just seem to be okay with all the bad things that happen in the world? Why does he say things like this? If he's good... Do, why doesn't it seem like he cares? What, what about the Holocaust? You hear that one often. What about this atrocity? What about that atrocity? Well, looking here, he's not okay with it. He detests it. He is adamantly and eternally angry with evil and those who commit it. He hates evil the wicked, and those who do violence. If we understand him to be a loving God, we shouldn't be surprised to read about such a, a righteous, indignant anger. His wrath, I would argue, is a natural flip side of the coin, is a natural part of his, his love, in which he can extend the fullness of his loving expression. And this would be a teaching that we really don't like to talk about, but we must follow the logic of it. If God loves what is good, what is pure, what is beautiful, he is not going to love everything that is set against these very things. If you love your children, if you love your spouse, you will hate the intruder that comes into your house to harm them when you're gone. If you are not furious at someone who, who hurts these people you love, your love might be called into question. And now I'm not making any qualitative uh, judgment about forgiveness and mercy and grace because I think naturally those things do come to bear in all of these things. But when injustice is done against someone whom we love, our first reaction typically will be a grotesque dislike, a hatred of whatever the act that was done against those whom we love. In the same way and more, I think God's love for righteousness is matched with his utter detesting of wickedness. His deep love for his people would be a fraud without an equal passionate disgust for the nature of sin, for iniquity that plagues our world. And those that do wicked, we pray that, that God will give them more time to see the error in their ways and repent and believe and anchor themselves to the same faith we do. This is part of the importance even of something like the Great Commission. For those that act accordingly would hear about such a refuge as Christ. God's judgment is not something that is fantasy. It's not fiction. In fact, we can already read about it in the Bible. God has already rained down coals of fire and sulfur in human history as we read about Sodom and Gomorrah. And Scripture says another 
another day like this is coming. So once again, oh, may we heed the, the imperatives, the commands of God to go into all the world and tell people about the good news. To rescue them from such things. That they wouldn't flee to whatever their mountain is, but that they would stay and have a steadfast confidence that whatever it is they're dealing with, God can be a source of their refuge. May they find, once again, the only lasting refuge in our Lord. And may we learn to trust in Him all the same continually, even more. And then verse 7, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. Here we are on the flip side of the coin again. The upright shall behold his faith, his face. Again, our prayer for those who, who might not know the love of Christ or reject it is that they would receive this same reward that the righteous will, the same reward that the faithful do. As the world totters and shakes around us as foundations crumble we need to be sure that we continue to seek righteousness and act justly for the Lord loves these things if we flee if we seek refuge somewhere else on some other mountain we'll never be satisfied with the true goodness only the Lord can provide God's promise for those who trust him is that they will see his face If you do not love the Lord, then this is something that is confusing to you. That a reward could be seeing somebody's face. But if you know the great love and the lengths by which God came to rescue you in order to save you, this is one of the greatest rewards that could ever be. Think about it. The God of the universe, the ruler of all that was ever made by his own hands, desires you to be in his presence. For he loves you. And not only that, but he has met the requirements needed to secure your presence before him. It's a big deal to be in the throne room of a king. I don't know if any of us have ever had that privilege. My guess is not. But it would be a big deal to gain that presence. And typically, who's the one seeking that present out, presence out? It's us that goes to seek the presence of a king. But here... God is seeking out an audience with us. He's coming to us, bringing us to Him. It's a big difference there. Again, why? Well, it's out of His great love for us. But as we know, we fall short of this righteous ideal. Sometimes our testing that the Lord does for us, we, are en we end up on our own mountain. Sometimes our deeds can or, or would not be characterized as righteous. But thanks be to God that we do have Jesus. And ultimately, I would say that this, this is a psalm that anticipates Jesus. It ultimately points forward to him. How? Well, who is the true, just man that has never committed any iniquity? Again, we, we strive to do righteousness to some extent, but oh, how often we fail. And yet Jesus is the righteous one to whom it was said about in Luke 23, we indeed suffer justly, but this man has done nothing wrong. That was declared of him. That was the ruling of Jesus. He's done nothing wrong. A perfect, spotless lamb. And so ultimately at the backdrop then of this, this psalm is, is that Holy Friday on which Jesus would suffer and die. When all the arrows and bows of the world were bent against this most righteous of a man. However, Jesus did not run, did he? 
He knew he would have to face it. He never fled. He asked if the Lord might take this cup from him, but this was ultimately going to be the way that the Lord would acquire salvation for all who would believe. And so Jesus trusted the Father in this. And he had faith that his his Father's plan was good. And so in those moments too, he found refuge. And indeed, in the end, what happens? Well, Jesus rises again from the dead and is seated at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for you, interceding for me, offspring of His righteousness, shoots of His glory, and people of His house whom continue to come under His roof for shelter. He is our place of refuge. So again, when the fabric of our society feels like it's crumbling and shaken and, and we're in the midst of some intense suffering and groaning, longing for the Lord to return. May we consider, consider where our place of refuge is. May we consider what our vices and temptations are. What the potential mountains are that we run to instead of running to the Lord for refuge. May we go and turn to Him in faith, never fleeing, but always believing and trusting that He is faithful and good to us, as His promises in Genesis 50, Romans 8, tells us. And may we, as we ponder these things about Him, may we see these evidences in our lives as we look back and reflect on them. Uh, I'll make mention of it now. This is part of the reason that I'm excited we're bringing back God's story, my story. At least we're trying to. Um, so in two, two Sundays, we're doing God's story, my story. And Melody and Cody are going to graciously share with us some things just like this. Evidence is in our lives of the Lord's goodness to us. Where we have come from. How he is bringing us along. Where we are now. How his love is evident in our lives. And so again, for all of us, may we be able to look back on our lives and find these very things when we run to the Lord in faith. May we always find our comfort and satisfaction in Him and in Him alone, not the cheap pleasures of the world. For only Christ can truly satisfy all of our wants and desires. God is our refuge, and so may we cling to Him. Let's pray to close. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that as Elmer opened, that this is a day in which you have made. We thank you that in your steadfast love, in your your sustaining the very objects uh, that worship you, the very world you created, that you have given us such a gracious gift as the present. And God, I pray that uh, we would just be be thankful of the breath that fills our lungs, recognizing each and every one as a sweet gift from you. And then as we look around us and see the people gathered together, as we look around us, as we step outside into the world, I pray that we would ultimately give you the glory for for all the beautiful things that you have created for us to enjoy. And God, I pray that when the going gets tough, I, I pray that we would not heed the advice of some of our peers that say, run away. But I pray that we would cling to you in faith. That we would anchor ourselves to you as our refuge. That we would come under your roof for our true shelter. And God, I pray that the people around us in our lives that, that don't know you, that choose violence, that oblige their sin. God, I pray that you would convict their hearts. People we interact with that are like this, God, I pray that we would offer them encouragement and hope and a true source of refuge and satisfaction for their longing souls that do long for so much more. God, help us to be salt and light in the world you've placed us in. 
We love you. We pray this in your precious name.